老师好，我是英语三的陈逸轩，四十九号。我要念的部分是《Adventures of Huckleberry Finn》，这是第二段，是从第四章开始。Well, three or four months run along, and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most all the time and could spell and read and write just a little, and could say the multiplication table up to six times. Seven is thirty-five, and I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. At first, I hated the school, but by and by, I got so I could stand it. Whenever I got uncommon tired, I played hooky, and the hiding I got next day done me good and cheered me up. So the longer I went to school, the easier it got to be. I was getting sort of used to the widow's way too, and they weren't so raspy on me. Living in the house and sleeping in the bed pulled on me pretty tight mostly, but before the cold weather, I used to slide out and sleep in the woods sometimes, and so that was a rest to me. I liked the old ways best, but I was getting so I liked the new ones too a little bit. The widow said I was coming along slow but sure and doing very satisfactory. She said she weren't ashamed of me. One morning, I happened to turn over the salt cellar at breakfast. I reached for some of it as quick as quick as I could to throw over my left shoulder and keep off the bad luck. But Miss Watson was in head、uh, in ahead of me and crossed me off. She says, "Take your hands away, Huckleberry. What a mess you are always making." The widow put in a good word for me. But that weren't going to keep off the bad luck. I know that well enough. I started out after breakfast, feeling worried and shaky, and wondering where it was going to fall on me, and what it was. There, you see it as a for a consideration. That means I bought it of you and pay you for it. Here's a dollar for you. Now you sign it. So I sign it and left. Miss Watson's nigger Jim had a hair ball as big as your fist, which had been took out of the fore stomach of an ox. And he used to do magic with it. He said there was a spirit inside of it, and he knew everything. So I went to him that night and told him Pap was there again, for I found his tracks in the snow. What I wanted to know was what he was going to do, and was he going to stay? Jim got out his hair ball and said something over it, and then he held it up and dropped it on the floor. It fell pretty solid and only rolled about an inch. Jim tried it again and then another time, and it acted just the same. Jim got down on his knees and put his ears against it, and listened, but it what it weren't no use. He said it wouldn't talk. He said sometimes it wouldn't talk without money. I told him I had an old slate counterfeit quarter that weren't no good because the brass showed through a silver a little, and it wouldn't pass no how. Even if the brass didn't show, because it was so slick it felt greasy, and so they would tell on it every time. I reckon I wouldn't say nothing about the dollar I got from the judge. I said it was pretty bad money, but maybe the hair ball would take it, because maybe it wouldn't know the difference. Jim smelled it and beat it and rubbed it, and said he would manage so the hair ball would think it was good. He said he would slip open a raw Irish potato and stick the crowder in between and keep it there all night. And next morning you couldn't see no brass, and you wouldn't feel greasy no more. And so anybody in town would take it in a minute, that along a hair ball. Well, I know a potato would do that before, but I had forgot it. Jim put the crowder under the hair ball, and got down and listened again. This time he said the hair ball was all right. He said it would tell my whole fortune if I wanted it to. I says go on. So the hair ball talked to Jim, and Jim told it to me. He says, "Your father don't know yet what he's going to do. Sometimes he expect he will go away, and then again he expect he will stay." The best way is to rest easy and let an old man take his own way. 
There's two angels hurrying round about him. One of them is white and shiny, and another is one is black. The white one gets him to go right a little while. Then the black one sail in and bust it all up. A body can tell yet which one going to fetch him at the last. But you all is right. You're going to have considerable trouble in your life, and considerable joy. Sometimes you're going to get hurt, and sometimes you're going to get sick. But every time you're going to get well again. There's two ghosts flying about in your life. One of them light and another one is dark. One is rich and another is poor. You're going to marry the poor one first, and then the rich one by and by. You want to keep way further than the water as much as you can, and don't run no risk, because it's down in the fields that you're going to get hung. When I lit my candle and went up to my room that night, there sat Pop, his own self. This is the end of chapter five. Now this is the end of chapter four. Here begins chapter five. I had shut the door too. Then I turned around, and there he was. I used to be scared of him all the time. He tempted me so much. I reckon I was scared now too, but in a minute I see I was mistaken. That is, after the first jolts, as you may say, when my breath thought of hitched, he being so unexpected. But right away after I see a warm scare of him worth bothering about. He was most fifty, and he looked it. His hair was long and tangled and greasy, and hung down, and you could see his eyes shining through like he was behind vines. It was all black, no grey. So was his long mixed-up whiskers. There weren't no colour in his face where his face showed. He was white, not like another man's white, but a white to make a body sick, a white to make a body's flesh crawl. A tree trod white, a fish belly white. As for his clothes, just rags. That was all. He had one ankle resting on another knee. The boat on that foot was busted, and two of his toes stuck through. And he wore them now and then. His head was laying on the floor, and an old black sludge with the top cave in, like a lid. I stood a looking at him. He sat there a looking at me. With his chair tilted back a little, I set the candle down. I noticed the window was up, so he had clumb in bed by the shade. He kept a looking me all over. By and by, he says, "Starchy clothes, very. You think you're a good deal of a big bug, don't you?" Maybe I am. Maybe I am," says. "Don't you give me long of your lip," says he. You've put on considerable many frills since I've been away. I'll take you down a peg before I get down with you. You're educated too, they say. Can read and write. You think you're better than your father now, don't you? Because he can't make it till out of you. Who told you my meadow with such helpless foolishness? Hey, who told you you could? The widow, she told me. The widow, hey. And who told the widow she could put in her shovel about a thing that on none of her business? Nobody never told her. Well, I'll learn her how to meddle. And looky here, you drop that squall, you hear? I'll learn people to bring up a boy to put on airs over his own father, and that on to be better's what he is. You let me catch you fooling around that squall again, you hear? Your mother couldn't read, and she couldn't write neither. Before she died, none of the family could before they died. I can't, and here you are swelling yourself up like this. I am the man to stand it. You hear? Say, let me hear you read. I took up a book and began something about General Washington and the wars. Now read about a half a minute. He fetched the book and a whack with his hand and knocked it across the house. He says, "It's so. You can do it." I had my doubts when you told me. Now look here. You stop that putting on frills. I won't have it. I'll lay for you, my smarty. And if I could catch you about that school, I'll tan you good. First, you know you'll get religion too. I never see such a son. He took up a little blue and yellow paper, of some cows and a boy, 
and says, What's this? It's something they give me for learning my lessons good. He tore it up and says, I'll give you something better. I'll give you a cowhide. He sat there and mumbling and growling a minute, and then he says, And you a sweet scented dandy low, a bed, and black clothes, and a looking glass and a piece of carpet on the floor. And your own father got to sleep with the horse in the ten yard. I never see such a son. I bet I will take some of those frills out of you before I'm done with you. Why, there are no end to your heirs. They say you are rich. Hey, how's that? They lie, that's how. Look at here, mighty, how you talk to me. I'm a standing about all I can stand now, so don't give me no sense. I've been in town two days and I had heard nothing about you being rich. I heard about it away down the river too, that's why I come. You give me that money tomorrow, I want it. I ain't got no money. It's a lie, Judge Thatcher got it. You got it. I want it. I ain't got no money. I tell you, you ask Judge Thatcher, he'll tell you the same. All right, I'll ask him, and I will make him pungo too, or I will know the reason why. Say, how much you got in your pocket, I want it. I ain't got only a dollar, and I want that too. It don't make no difference what you want it for, you just show it out. He took it and bit it to see if it was good, and then he said he was going downtown to get some whiskey, said he hadn't had a drink all day. When he had got out on the shade, he put his head in again, and cussed me for putting on frills and trying to be better than him. And when I reckoned he was gone, he come back and put his head in again, and told me to mind about that school, because he was going to lay for me and lick me if I didn't drop that. Next day he was drunk, and he went to Judge Thatcher's, and bull ragged him, and tried to make him give up the money, but he couldn't, and then he swore he'd make the law force him. The judge and the widow went to law to get the court to take me away from him and let one of them be my guardian, but it was a new judge that had just come, and he didn't know the old man. So he said courts mustn't interfere and separate families if they could help it. Said he would rather not take a child away from his father. So Judge Thatcher and the widow had to quit on the business. That pleased the old man till he couldn't rest. He said he would cowhide me till I was black and blue if I didn't raise some money for him. I borrowed three dollars from Judge Thatcher, and Pap took it and got drunk, and went a blowing around and cussing and whooping and carry on. And he kept it up all over town with a tin pan, till most midnight. They, then they jailed him. And next day they had him before court, and jailed him again for a week. But he said he was satisfied, said he was boss of his son, and he'll make it warm for him. When he got off, a new judge said he was a going to make a man of him, so he took him to his own house and dressed him up clean and nice. And had him to breakfast and dinner and supper with the family, and was just old pie to him, so to speak. And after supper, he talked to him about temperance and such things till the old man cried and said he had been a fool and fought away his life, but now he was a going to turn over a new leaf and be a man nobody wouldn't be ashamed of, and he hoped the judge would help him and not look down on him. The judge said he could hug him for them words, so he cried, and his wife she cried again. Pop said he'd been a man that had always been misunderstood before, and the judge said he believed it. The old man said that what the man wanted that was done was sympathy, and the judge said it was so. So they cried again, and when it was that time, the old man rose up and held out his hand and says. Look at it, gentlemen and ladies. So, take a hold of it, shake it. There's a hand that was the hand of a hug, but the end so no more. It's the hand of a man that started in on a new life, and will die before he'll go back. You mark them words. Don't forget I said them. It's a clean hand now. Shake it. Don't be afraid. 
so they shook it one after the other, all around and cried. The judge's wife she kissed it. Then the old man he signed a pledge and his mark. The judge said it was the holiest time on record, or something like that. Then they tucked the old man into a beautiful something, beautiful room which was a spare room. And in the night, sometime he got hard for thirsty and climbed out onto the porch roof and slid down a stanchion and traded his new coat for a jug of forty rod, and climbed back again and had a good old time. And towards that light, he crawled out again, drunk as a fiddler, and rolled off the porch and broke his left arm in two places. And was most froze to death when somebody found him after sunup, and when they come to look at that spare room, they had to take soundings before they could navigate it. The judge he felt kind of sore. He said he reckoned the body could reform the old man with a shotgun, maybe, but he didn't know. But he didn't know other way. The end of chapter five. Chapter six. Well, pretty soon the old man was up and around again, and then he went for Judge Thatcher in the courts to make him give up that money, and he went for me too, for not stopping school. He catched me a couple of times and thrashed me, but I went to school just the same, and dodged him or outrun him most of the time. I didn't want to go to school much before, but I reckon I would go now to spite Pap. That low trial was a slow business. Appeared like they weren't ever going to get started on it. So every now and then I would board, borrow two or three dollars off the judge for him, to keep from getting a cup hitting. Every time he got money, he got drunk, and every time he got drunk, he raised can around town, and every time he raised can, he got jailed. He was just suited. This kind of thing was right in his line. He got to hang around the widows too much, and so he she told him at last that if he didn't quit, if he didn't quit using around there, she would make trouble for him. Well, wasn't he mad? He said he would show who was Huck Finn's boss. So he watched out for me one day in the spring and catch me, and took me up to the river about three mile away in a skiff. And cross over to the Illinois shore, where it was woody, and there were no houses but an old log hut in a place where the timber was so thick you couldn't find it if you didn't know where it was. He kept me with him all the time, and I never got a chance to run off. We lived in that old cabin, and he always locked the door and put the key under his head nights. He had a gun which he had stole. I reckon. And we finish, and we fished and hunted, and that was what we live on. Every little while he locked me in and went down to the store, three miles to the ferry, and traded fish and game for a whiskey, and fetched it home and got drunk and had a good time and licked me. The widow she found out where I was by and by, and she sent a man over to try to get hold of me. But Pap drove him off with the gun, and it wasn't long after that till I was used to being there where I was, and like it, oh, but the cowhide part. It was kind of lazy and jolly, laying off comfortable all day, smoking and fishing, and no books nor study. Two months or more run along, and my clothes got to be all rags and dirt. And I didn't see how I ever got to like it so well at the widow's, where you had to wash and eat on a plate and come up and go to bed and get up regular, and before ever bothering over a book and have old Miss Watson packing at you all the time. I didn't want to get back no more. I had stopping cussing because the widow didn't like it, but now I took it again because Pop had no objections. It was pretty good times up in the woods there. Take it all around. But by and by, Pap got got too handy with his hickory, and I couldn't stand it. I was all overwhelmed. He got to going away so much too, and locking me in. 
Once he locked me in and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he had got drowned and I wasn't ever going to get out anymore. I was scared. I made up my mind I would fix out some way to live there. I had tried to get off of what that cabin many a time, but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up that chimbley. It was too narrow. The door was thick, solid oak slabs. Pap was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away. I reckon I had hunted the place over as much as a hundred times. Well, I was most all the time at it, because it was all about the only way to put in the time. But this time I found something at last. I found an old rusty wood saw without any handle. It was laid in between a rafter and the clapboards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin behind the table, to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and rest the blanket, and went to work to saw a section of the big button lock out, big enough to let me through. Well, it was a good job, but I was getting toward the end of it when I heard pops gone in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work and dropped the blanket and hit my saw. And pretty soon, Pop came in. Pop weren't in a good humor, so he was his natural safe. He said he was downtown and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get the money if they ever got started on the trial. But then there was ways to put it off a long time, and Judge Thatcher know how to do it. And he said people allow there be another trial to get me away from him, and give me to the widow for my guardian, and they guess he would win this time. This should me I'm considerable, because I didn't want to go back to the widows any more and be so cramped out, and civilized, as they called it. Then the old man got to cussing and cussed everything and everybody he could think of. And then cussed them all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any, and after that he polished off with a kind of general cuss all around, including a considerable parcel of people which he didn't know the names of, and so called them what his name when he got to them. It went right along with his cussing. He said he would like to see the widow get me. He said he would watch out, and if they tried to come any such game on him. He know of a place six or seven miles off to stow me in, where they might hunt till they drop and they couldn't find me. That made me pretty uneasy again, but only for a minute. I reckon I wouldn't stay on hand till he got that chance. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he had got. There was a fifty-pound sack of corn meal, and a side of bacon, ammunition. And a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and an old book and two newspapers for wedding. Besides some towel, I tied it up a load and went back and sat down on the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over, and I reckon I would walk off with the gun and some lies, and tack to the woods when I run away. I guess I wouldn't stay in one place, but just tramp right across the country. Mostly night times and hunt and fish, to keep alive, and so get so far away that the old man nor the widow could ever find me any more. I judged I would sell out and leave that night if Pap got drunk enough, and I reckoned he could. I got so full of it I didn't notice how long I was staying till the old man hollered and asked me whether I was asleep or drunked. I got the things all up to the cabin, and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper, the old man took a swig or two and got sort of warmed up, and went to ripping again. He had been drunk over it in town, and lay in the gutter all night, and he was a sight to look at. A body would a thought he was Adam. He was just old mud. Whenever his liquor began to work. He most always went for the government. 
This time he says, Tell this a government. Why? Just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law standing ready to take a man's son away from him, a man's own son, which he has had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raising. Yes, just as that man has got that son raised at last, and ready to go to work and begin to do something for him and give him the rest. The law up and goes for him, and they call that government, that an o nerder. The law backs that old judge Thatcher up and helps him to keep me out of my property. Here's what the law does: the law takes a man worth six thousand dollars and upwards, and jams him into an old trap of a cabin like this, and lets him go around in clothes and that and freedom for a hug. They call that government. A man can't get his right in the government like this. Sometimes I've mighty notion to just leave the country for good and all. Yes, and I told them so. I told old Thatcher so to his face. Lots of them heard me and can tell what I said. Say, say, for two cents I'll leave the blank country and never come near it again. Then that's the very words I say to get my hat. If you call the hat, but the lid rests up and the rest of it goes down till it below my chin, and then it ain't really a hat at all, but more likely my hat was shoved up through a joint stop pipe. Look at it, says I. Such a hat for me to wear. One of the wealthiest men in this town, if I could get my rights. Oh yes, this is a wonderful government. Wonderful. Well, looky here, there was a free nigger there from Ohio, a mulatter, most as white as a white man. He had the whitest shirts on your ever see, too, and the shiniest hat. And there on the man in that town that's got as the fine clothes as what he had, and he had a gold watch and a chain, and a silver-headed cane. The awfulest old red-headed nabob in the state, and what do you think? They said he was a professor in a cold college, and could talk all kinds of languages, and know everything, and that on the west, they say he would vote when he was at home. Well, that let me out. Thinks I, what is the country a coming to? It was election day. I was just about to go to and vote myself if I weren't too drunk to get there, but when they told me there was a state in this country where they would let a nigger vote, I drove out. I says I will never vote again. That's the very words I say. They all hurt me, and the country made rot for all me. I'll never vote again as long as I live, and to see the cool way of that nigger. Why he wouldn't give me the road if I hadn't shoved him off of the way? I say to the people, why aren't this nigger put up at auction and sold? That's what I want to know. And what do you reckon they say? Why they say he couldn't be sold till they had been the state six months, and he hadn't been there that long yet. There now, that's a specimen. They call that a government that can sell a free nigger till he's been in the state six months. Here's a government that calls itself a government, and that ought to be a government, and thinks it it is a government, and yet it's got to stay stuck still for six whole months before it can take a hold of prowling, thieving, infernal, white-shirted free nigger, and. Pop was going on, so he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to. So he went ahead over hills, over the top of Salt Park, and barked both shines. The rest of his speech was all of the hottest kind of language, mostly half at the nigger and the government. Though he gave the top some too, all along here and there, he hopped around the cabin considerable, first on one leg and then the other. Holding first one shine and the other one, and at last he let out with his left foot all of a sudden, and fetched the drop, a rattling kick. By one good judgment, because.
because that was the boat that had a couple of his toes leaking out of the front end of it. So now he raised a hole that fairly made a body's hair raise, and down he went in the dirt, and rolled there, and held his toes, and the cussing he had done that led over anything he had ever done previous. He said so his own self afterwards. He had heard old Solberry Hagen in his best days, and he said it led over him too, but I reckon they was sort of piling it on maybe. After supper, Pop took the jug and said he's had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one tremens. That was always his word. I judged that he would be blind drunk in about an hour, and I would steal the key or sell myself out, one or the other. He drank and drank and tumbled down on his blankets by and by, but luck didn't run my way. He didn't go sound asleep, but was uneasy. He growled and moaned and thrashed around this way and that for a long time. At last I got so sleepy I couldn't keep my eyes open all I could do. And so before I know what I was about, I was sound asleep, and a candle burning. I don't know how long I was asleep, but all of a sudden there was an awful scream and I was up. There was Pop looking wild, and skipping around every which way and yelling about snakes. He said they was crawling up his legs, and then he would give a drum and scream, and say one had bit him on the, che on the cheek, but I couldn't see no snakes. He started and ran around and around the cabin, hollering, Take him off, take him off, he's spotting me on the neck. I never see a man look so wild in the eyes. Pretty soon he was all affected out and fell down panting. Then he rolled over and over wonderful fast, kicking things every which way, and striking and grappling at the air with his hands, and screaming and saying there was a devil's a hold of him. He wore out by and by, and that still a while, moaning. Then he lay stiller, and didn't make a sound. I could hear the owls and the wolves away off in the woods, and it seemed terrible still. He was laying over by the corner. By and by he raised up part way and listened, with his head to one side. He says, very slow, Trump, 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 that's the dead, Trump. Tramp, tramp, they're coming after me, but I won't go. Oh, they're here. Don't touch me, don't. Hands off. They're cold, let's go. Oh, that's poor devil alone. Then he went down on all fours and crawled off, begging them to let him alone. And he rolled himself up his blankets and wallowed in under the old pine table. Still a begging, and then he went to crying. I could hear him through the blankets. By and by he rolled out and jumped out on his feet, on his feet looking wild, and he see me and went for me. He chased me round and round the place with a clasp knife, calling me the angel of death, and saying he would kill me, and I couldn't come for him no more. I begged, and I told him I was only Huck, but he laughed such a screechy laugh, and roared and cussed, and kept on chasing me up. Once, when I turned short and dodged under his arm, he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders. And I thought I was gone, but I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself. Pretty soon he was all tired out and dropped down with his back against the door and said he would rest a minute and then kill me. He put his knife under him and said he would sleep and get strong and then he would see who was who. So he dozed off pretty soon. By and by got the old split button chair and clumb up as easy as I could, not to make any noise, and got down the gun. I slid the rent roll down it to make sure it was loaded. Then I let it across the turnip barrel pointing towards Pop and sat down behind it to wait for him to steer. And how slow and still the time did drag along. This is the end of chapter 6.